Hello, everyone who's been able to log on already. We still have uh, many more people who are um, streaming in virtually. Um, so in about a minute, we can start. So as soon as it seems like it's starting to slow to a trickle, we'll um, begin. Okay, I think that we're ready to begin. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening and also for showing um, so much interest in this um, hugely uh, effective topic right now. And um, you might, some of you might be aware of this uh, new series that we started at the library called, called Civics Lab, which invites local, uh, local members to engage in important conversations that deal with uh, civic life, that deal with government, that deal with um, our lives as uh, citizens and, and human beings. And that uh, where we can you know, come together to learn more and, and talk more and share um, information with each other. And speaking of sharing information, I uh, also want to make sure that we, we talk a little bit about um, misinformation and what, how uh, how damaging it can be, especially in a case like what's going on in, in uh, Ukraine right now. So I like to give a little plug out just to check your sources anytime you are sharing information about really about anything, but especially about uh, the war in Ukraine right now. Um, before you share or retweet or tap anything in social media, please check uh, the source of that information, uh, verify it, make sure you can do a reverse image search in Google to make sure this is what this image is what it says it is. You can check the um, source of the, if it's a story, does that person have a byline, um, all kinds of things. And um, there, uh, we have lots of ways to figuring these things out or assessing this information on um, uh, from the, the library. And uh, if you're wondering what you can do to help anyone, this is one of the first things that you can do is to make sure that you're sharing verified and verifiable information. Uh, and I also should mention that um, I have a very diluted version of our speaker's um, heritage, uh, uh, our speaker tonight's heritage. My mother um, is a Russian, she was a Russian immigrant and um, she's actually half Russian, half Ukrainian, which is a very common mix, as you'll hear. Um, so, uh, and I didn't um, even think that uh, Ukrainian was a separate language until very recently. And it's very, um, it's very exciting to see uh, this, this history and this culture. 
And uh, tonight, um, Anastasia Bard is going to be talking with us about this history and culture and also what is happening in, currently in, in Ukraine. Um, Anastasia was born in Kiev and she immigrated to the United States when she was 14. She attended New York University, majored in broadcast journalism, and has worked in the industry for 20 years. Uh, her experience includes ABC, Good Morning America Sunday, um, NBC Dateline, um, NBC News International Desk. The last two years before she um, before she became a um, freelancer, she started concentrating, um, uh, or before she became a freelancer, to concentrate on her family. She worked as the head of the foreign news desk at Fox News Channel. She has traveled as a field journalist to many locations, including Russia and Ukraine, and um, spent an entire month in Iraq in 2004, which seems like good preparation. Um, now she has an, her own company. She's co-founded with a business partner, teaching children together with um, her business partner about world history and different cultures. Uh, Anastasia has been a Ridgewood resident for 10 years along with her husband, who is also um, Ukrainian-American, Konstantin Sirotkin, who was born in Kharkiv, which is one of the areas very hard hit um, in this current war, and with their two wonderful daughters here in Ridgewood. Um, so tonight, Anastasia is going to give an overview of uh, historic background on Ukraine, and then uh, we'll take a few uh, questions that people have already posed um, when they registered. And if you didn't ask a question or something occurs to you this evening, which I hope happens, um, please add your question to the chat and we will take it there. Um, so I'm going to put myself on mute and I'll let you start speaking now. Thanks very much, Anastasia. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. I love doing library programs with kids. So this is my first time uh, talking to adults. So I hope I don't make it too much fun uh, for us as we are a bit older um, group. But as a journalist, you know, for 20 years, I've learned not to have an opinion, my own, you know, never participated in any rallies. I've never spoken up against anyone or anything, whatever my personal views will be. So I have a good sort of um, look at history uh, to be try to be as impartial as possible. And it's not easy to be impartial when the country where I was born is being bombed. But I will try because I don't have any animosity personally against Russian people, despite what is going on. So I'll just share with you both what I know about the history and what I think is important for all of us to know as American citizens, right? And perhaps just the information itself might be helpful. So I will share with you uh, a couple of slides that I have prepared because the history of um, Ukraine and Russia is indeed very much intertwined. It began with the early Slavs. Yes, the Slavic languages. Those are the early Slavs. They were nomads who settled in the river valleys and very fertile land. And they have created small cities, small villages. The legend says it that the three brothers and their sister Swan were the first to build a settlement on the river, which became the capital of Ukraine, Kyiv. So again, just like Romulus and Remus were the founders of Rome, it's a legend. Do we know now if it's 100% true? Perhaps not. But so to speak, perhaps they were the first founders of Ukraine. And of course, back then there was no Christianity yet. They were all pagan uh, believers. They believed in gods of lightning, just like the ancient Greeks. And indeed, this was the time where people in those lands, which are the Scythians, a lot of them were nomads and a lot of them traded with the ancient Greeks. So we're talking about a very long time ago and very interesting time indeed. Um, another historical sort of perspective on this is that the Slavs have invited Vikings to come from what would be sort of Sweden territory to come and rule over them in the Slavic lands because a lot of the tribes didn't get along with each other. Now, some historians are saying, no, that's not cannot be possible because I'm sure they could figure it out themselves. But it is the official Russian sort of history version is that the Vikings called with a um, tribal name Rus were the ones who came from the Northern lands and settled in the Russian lands in the North and slowly moved towards what is now this city called Kyiv. Now, this was a very large city 
in the medieval times. It was initially made all sort of like a, a castle, right? A wooden castle. It became quite rich and it traded with the Byzantine Empire and with the Northern lands. But at that time, when we're talking about the medieval times, right? Just as Christianity was starting in Europe, um, this was the time where Kiev itself was a very prosperous city and the Slavic lands were still pagan, but very successful fighting the nomads to the east and so on. Uh, the, uh, would say Grand Knyaz, or you can call him a king of the land, in the end of the 10th century, visited the Byzantine Empire and brought Christianity to Kyiv. So now, as in about a thousand years ago, we're looking at Kyiv becoming the capital of, at that point, a country called Kyiv and Rus. There is no Moscow yet. We're talking about Kyiv as being the number one city in the land. Unfortunately, after Kyiv and Rus, as you can see on the map here, this was kind of a large area leading up to the Black Sea, trading with the Byzantine Empire, but everything here to the east is the nomads and further on the Mongol Empire. So this beautiful city with someone just told me it looks like a Disney castle <laughs> ended up being ultimately conquered and burned down by the Mongols who kept traveling west. Now the Mongol Empire was one of the largest ever created. Like we're talking about here the 13th century when Genghis Khan and then his sons and grandsons went as far as Austria to the west. So as you can see, this is the Black Sea. All of this territory on top of the Black Sea, everything that would now be considered Ukraine and a lot of the Russian territory was all controlled by the Mongols. Now, Mongols were very wise. They wouldn't necessarily stay in the area, but they would make Russians or Ukrainians. At that point, there was no word Ukrainian, but the Kievan Rus had to pay tribute. So here is like an example of what the Mongol domination would look like. They burned down cities. They brought their uh, king's tent, right? the Khan's tent. So it's quite a, a big part of overall Russian history. For 250 years, the Russian uh, princes had to bow down and pay tribute to the Mongols. Now, eventually, with starting with the 14th century, the Kievan um, power had decreased significantly, but it was the Moscow princes who took up the struggle against the Mongols. So now, until that point, Moscow was a very small city. Here we are, the White Kremlin. Now, you may remember pictures of Kremlin and Moscow being red. Well, the first one wasn't red. That was actually built by some Renaissance architects who came to visit from Italy and rebuild the Kremlin walls in red. The first Kremlin was quite beautifully done in white stone. And this is when Moscow was establishing itself as a very powerful and rich city. It did indeed become a capital when one of the uh, princes, whose name was actually Ivan III, who united all the small Russian sort of governed states and made it into one country. Now let's look at the map here. You can see again, just for reference, here's the Black Sea. Now we already have an Ottoman Empire, which took over the Byzantine. There's quite large Polish territory. There's still lots of hordes, right? Those Eastern nomads. And look at the relatively small Muscovy. Yes, so that's around Moscow, the Moscow state. It wasn't even Russia yet, just a Moscow state that was waiting to grow stronger. Now you might know the guy who made it stronger. I don't know if you recognize, but he's quite terrible. So Ivan the Terrible or Ivan the Fourth was uh, actually quite a good fighter, a good commander of his forces. And he was able to unite large territories in his country, who both extended east and was able to go further south. So he had fought with a lot of different Khans and was able to make Russian territory large. The Ottoman Empire was still very powerful in the south. So if you're looking at this peninsula, that's Crimea. Crimea for a very long time had belonged to Ottoman Empire and before and after to different Khans that had 
sort of a change hands. Poland still remains to be quite large power in the Western Europe. And as we continue on, who are the Ukrainians? Where do they come from? Well, throughout the history, both when it was the Moscow is growing stronger, when it was the Polish being strong, or whether it was the Ottoman Empire, the people who lived what would now be Ukrainian were very much connected to their land. So some of them were farmers, but a lot of them were really freedom fighters because they fought either against Khan, sometimes against the Polish, and they always connected to their roots, right? So this is a very, uh, I suppose, basic interpretation, but you can see a Cossack here with a shaved head, his long mustache, and the traditional dress of a young lady. It's a very Ukrainian picture, right? You, would, you might recognize it as being Slavic or Ukrainian, and that was part of the identity at that time. The Cossacks ever since that time, and we're talking about 16th century and further on, have always tried to assert their independence. Not always successfully. Now, back in, this was 1648, when there was a Ukrainian revolt against Poland, they realized that the Ukrainians didn't have enough power to stand up to the Polish. Poland wanted to swallow those lands in the South. So the Ukrainian Cossacks have turned to a Tsar in Moscow and they said, let's form a military alliance, help us against the Polish. Initially it worked, but then this lady, a very smart German princess who became known as Catherine the Great and ruled Russia for 34 years, very successfully waged a war against the Ottoman Empire. And again, here's the Crimea. Here's the state was called the New Russia. So Catherine, while she was conquering the lands of the Crimean Khanate, she also was able to create what's, what, what was called at the end of the 17th century, the New Russia. Now, the Cossacks lived in this area and initially they didn't mind because they were freed from the rule of the Khan. But as the Russian state tried to make them more and more uh, Russian, I suppose, and less have their own identity, they were fighting against it because Catherine took away the military heads sort of uh, attributes of power. She said, you cannot have your own army. You cannot have your own rule. And your general who's in charge of Ukraine, so to speak, or the new Russia has to bow down to us, to the imperial family in St. Petersburg, which was the capital back then. So there were a lot of changes that happened between like 18th century to the revolution where slowly and gradually small things were changing and chipping away and chipping away at the Cossack, um, you suppose, independence and definitely cultural identity. They were trying to change the language, make them part of the Russian empire and make as many changes as possible. Now, this photo, which I went to prematurely is the last imperial family. The gentleman in the center, that's Nicholas II. He's the last Tsar or Emperor of Russia, and that's his family. One of these young ladies, I'm not sure which one is actually Anastasia, <laughs> but unfortunately they, we know that they have all um, been um, gotten rid of during the revolution. And what happened to the Russian empire? So first of all, it was a very large territory. We all know it went all the way West. At that point, at the, before the time of Russian revolution, it included the territory of Poland. So Russia wasn't just trying to take away, um, the Russian empire wasn't just taking away the Cossack or the Ukrainian identity. It was also trying to russify Poland and a lot of the other lands which are now separate states on their own, like Latvia or Lithuania, Estonia, all of that was Russian territory. Now look at Finland, a, lot, a large part of Finland belonged to the Russian empire as well at that time. So that were all these different territories, including Georgia, um, let's see this Caucasian mountains between Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. That's where Georgia is. That's where Armenia is. All of that was Russian empire. There were quite a few Caucasian mountain wars caught, um, uh, fought. So all of this territory was constantly the, on the edges. There were skirmishes and wars and all kinds of trouble. And 
uh, after the 1917 revolution, you might recognize this gentleman, right? This is the Lenin, who was the Soviet leader. He had led the revolt inside the Russian Empire to get rid of the rule of the emperor and try to give power to the people. Now, obviously, the simplified version didn't quite work out that way. But what happened with Ukraine and a few other territories is that they didn't want to join the Soviet Russia at first. So you may have heard the Red Army, the White Army. So the Red Army is the army of the communist state, the army that comes from Moscow, so to speak, and from Russia. And the White Army is everyone who didn't want to be part of the Bolshevik state, didn't want to become Soviet. So in Ukraine, there was very large support for the White Army. A lot of people actually escaped from, to Crimea who didn't want to be part of the Soviet state and eventually actually took the boats over to Istanbul, to Turkey, to run away from the Bolsheviks and the Soviet state. So I guess you can say that Ukraine and some other territories on the side have always had opposition to the influence that came from now Moscow, right? The, the, since the revolution, a little later after the revolution, St. Petersburg was no longer the capital. Now it became Moscow as the capital of the Soviet Union, not just Russia. Now, one of the things that how, how did Soviet Union become a country? How did it swallow up all these territories and force them to stay together? Well, they had to make a lot of concessions. They actually had to promise a lot of things to these smaller republics and say, if you stay part of the Soviet Union, we will allow you to speak your language. You can have your local government. You just need to make sure you listen to the big picture, right? To the party ideology. So yes, it is true. You could speak Ukrainian in Ukraine. You could speak Georgian in Georgia. However, Russian in many ways was forced on all these places that became now separate countries as the dominant language. For example, I was born in Ukraine. I should know how to speak Ukrainian. Well, I've forgotten the language because that was never my first language. In my school, I had to learn Russian and speak Russian in all my languages and all my subjects, except for one, Ukrainian. So I learned math in Russian. I sang in Russian. Uh, what other, you know, um, history was in Russian. Everything was in Russian except for one hour a day. So, and that's in the country called, or I should say in the Republic called Ukraine. Now there were more, there were different schools. Some schools were fully Ukrainian. So there was a big separation between the people who went to what's called a Russian school and a Ukrainian school. Very unusual way of growing up. Some cities, like for example, you might recognize now the name Kharkiv. Um, some cities were even more Russian than where I grew up in the capital. So Kharkiv people barely spoke Ukrainian. Again, my husband also from Ukraine. Neither one of us speaks Ukrainian, unfortunately. We may learn now. <laughs> so let's move on to what happens now. We have a civil war in uh, the Soviet Union. Between 1917 and 1921, this is when the Red and the White Army were trying to fight. The Bolsheviks ultimately won. They ultimately got all the territories to submit, and a lot of different revolts were put down. And after Lenin was assassinated, this gentleman came to, to power. Now, you may recognize him as Joseph Stalin. Now he was in power for a very long time and he one of his policies was against Ukraine and against some of the cultural sort of struggles inside Ukraine. In the 1930s, early 1930s, there was a terrible event called Holodomor, which basically means a lot of people died of hunger because even though Ukraine is the breadbasket of the, was considered the breadbasket of the former Soviet Union, all of that wheat was taken out and people just didn't have enough to eat. Some historians believe that it may have been done on purpose to try to sort of bring down the spirit of the people. It's, it's hard to say for sure, but definitely Stalin is responsible for this terrible event and millions of people have died because of this. And you know, there's terrible photos that were obviously made public. Now, between the 30s 
And after the World War II, everything was going on its own, so to speak. After World War II, as you know, things have separated. Now we have the Cold War, right? Where United States and the Soviet Union are not getting along. This is when the NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization was formed. Now it was formed in 1949. And the whole idea was, is to curb the Russian influence and the Russian expansion. Now, the initial 12 members were United States and Canada and a couple of countries in Europe, like Belgium, Denmark, France, and so on. They had all agreed to consider an attack on one state as an attack against all, meaning that if someone attacks Portugal, for example, then other, everyone would defend. Now, as we go on, NATO continued expanding. So it wasn't just 12 states anymore, right? Now NATO has 30 member states. And if you look at the dark color on the map, those were the initial members, right? So it was relatively on the west side. And as the color gets lighter, those new countries are being added on. We now have Germany joining. We now have Spain joining. Now Turkey's in the NATO. And all of the Eastern, almost all the Eastern European countries. It's only that Ukraine, Georgia, and this is Bosnia Herzegovina that wanted to join NATO, but obviously had trouble joining because Russia was not happy about that. So as I said, there's 30 members of states of NATO now, three aspiring states, and Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, was very concerned and still is about the expansion of NATO and what it might mean for Russian borders. So it was one of the reasons why Russia had definitely tried to uh, bring influence to Ukraine. Now, if you think of, uh, remember of 1989, this is when in Ukraine, there was the largest uh, nuclear disaster, Chernobyl. Right? There was a meltdown of one of the reactors. A lot of radioactive materials were released into the atmosphere. They went quite far west into Europe, which is how we found out about it, because the Ukrainians and the Russians were not planning to tell anyone if they didn't have to. But at that time, after the disaster was over, the Ukrainian people, there was a lot of dissent going on. Once again, this is 1989. Between 1989 and 1991, for two years, there was all these new ideas showing up in the press, in discussions with people. So by 91, they, Ukraine had organized a referendum to decide, do they want to stay part of the former Soviet Union or not? So in 91, right before the split, Ukraine indeed had voted that no, we do not want to stay part of the Soviet Union. And it was a quite a big, moment at that time in the country and certainly couldn't make the party line and the government of Moscow very happy. But Ukraine wasn't the only one. Now, um, I'm skipping through a bit of a history there as different states at different times were trying to become more independent and separate from Russia. Everyone had their own financial problems and political problems. So we come to 2013 where we have a wave of protests erupt in the capital, Kiev. This is the demonstration uh, right after Rose demonstration in Georgia, where Georgia was also trying to replace its government. And now Ukraine is trying to replace the, its government. Why? Well, because the president of Ukraine, the gentleman on the left with the blue tie, his name was Yanukovych, was a pro-Russian president and very friendly with Mr. Putin. And when Ukrainian parliament voted to have trade law, trade treaty, I should say, with European Union signed, Yanukovych said, no, we're not going to do it. And that was the reason why the protest came out on the street, why protesters came out. And there were thousands of people for a few months during the winter, staying out every day, taking out the um, capital sort of main square called Maidan, which is why the protest is called Ma Euro Maidan. So unfortunately, the protests turned violent. At one point, um, Yanukovych's main government no longer wanted to allow peaceful protests. And there was a lot of violence. More than 100 people were killed with snipers. 
And that was, I suppose, the last straw. At that point, the protesters didn't want to take it anymore. And Yanukovych's government was replaced. Yanukovych fled to a Russian controlled territory. And Ukraine has been fighting for independence from Russia ever since. Now, what was the other outcome of some of this is that unfortunately it really upset the government of Russia further that someone dared to be more independent. So at that point, Russia, uh, right after the Olympics that took place in Sochi uh, in 2014, uh, had taken over Crimean Peninsula and also brought in troops to the eastern part of Ukraine called Donbass. So a lot of the pretext for it, people have said is that there was Russian people and that they are being um, mistreated in Ukraine because they are Russian. So we need to defend the Russian population of Ukraine because they're not treated well. There have been plenty, you don't need me as a Ukrainian American to tell you one version of the story. You can certainly check the sources that most people say no it's not true uh, but please you know as uh, Larissa had said by all means always double check anything that you hear and read as much as you can and educate yourself but there have been uh, numerous reports even books written about this that this was an invasion from Russia it wasn't and they were not invited and there's certainly um, so sovereignty of Ukraine was in this case um, mistreated and they were not supposed to be there now does you Ukra do ukrainians want russians in there is there a portion of population of ukraine that wants russia in there i can tell you that even if there was before this war that's going on right now it doesn't seem that there is anyone now and the protests and the people standing up both around the world and in ukraine trying to send the message no we don't need russian troops in here no one needs saving leave us alone we want to be an independent country it has been quite overwhelming so it's been um, across the board clear that if putin thought he might be able to split ukraine and try to take part of it and make it russian his actions and this war actually united Ukraine and made it one cohesive state that forgot its differences and trying to defend itself. Um, now, to bring us to almost today, this is a map from yesterday from a British broadcaster that I trust. And let's look at the red territories. So the territory that has stripes on it that is currently controlled by Russian forces in Ukraine. So Crimea has always been controlled, right, for, for the last uh, eight years. Uh, a roll around Mariupol, this unfortunately besieged city that's been very much bombarded, around Kharkiv. Kharkiv itself, it's still standing. However, it's, it's, it's not in good shape, but there's some areas south of Kharkiv that are controlled by Russians and to the side here. And all of the red territory now as well. You can see a large port, Odessa, there's a lot of fighting around it now so that's another area there should be marked on the map but it's quite large section of ukraine um and just again i decided and we discussed it with Ms. brooks is that i didn't want you, you can see all the pictures of devastation online you don't need me to try to emotionally appeal to you and say this is how bad it looks but this is the city where my husband is from this is Kharkov before the bombing and this is the main square with what would be like the parliament building. So just like even one picture to tell the story, there's no blood, it's just rubble, but the devastation has been quite overwhelming. And many different analysts believe is that in, during the last two years, Mr. Putin had changed drastically his approach to how to handle the situation with a lot of the neighboring countries. So whether it's just Ukraine, or already highly influenced states like Belarus, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, all the dark red areas, they're heavily influenced by Russia. But a lot of the analysts believe that he wants to control and influence further. So that is 
the over and why is he able to succeed and influence people so much and why isn't russia protesting well certainly the television the television is fully controlled uh, by the russian state there was one independent channel that is uh, no longer on the air the internet is now controlled as well there are two uh, newspaper sources that are independent and in, always under a lot of strain and yes there are protests there have been thousands of people coming out here and there in different cities in russia they're very quickly detained within two minutes of someone coming out with a sign no to war they're taken away and they have a threat of up to 15 years in jail for protesting this is something brand new today this is an interesting development this is channel one in russia obviously an anchor sitting in the front and the lady behind with a sign no war stop the war don't believe the propaganda they're lying to you that's what it says in russian she is one of the main um, editors on that channel a lady who's 35 with two children and she stood up and reported this on the air today in moscow so this is uh, you know certainly things are slowly changing where some information is coming out not through the official channel certainly but in some of these protests it's trickling out so that's the sort of my overview that i wanted to share i hope it's not too much and i will be happy to answer questions that uh, thank you so much that was a, a lot to get through in a very short amount of time and i know that i really appreciate that kind of overview um thanks so much anastasia and oh one thing i should mention i think that chernobyl the disaster happened in 19 was it 1986 Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Did I say 89? I apologize. Yeah. 1986. I was there during that time, but I, you know, there's a lot of facts in my head right now. That's, so yes, yeah. And the time goes by really fast because it did hasten everything from uh, the, what happened in 1989 and after that. Um, but uh, in any case, we had a, a bunch of questions from uh, people who had registered already and also if anybody has any other questions please add them to the q a uh, i've added some resources some background um, reading and uh, just any other uh, some sources from our databases and also from other uh, reputable or reliable sources outside into the chat um, along with uh, the contact information for two uh, Ridgewood Eagle Scouts um, who are in Poland right now on a mission to help um, refugees in Ukraine. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you could add those to the Q&A, that's wonderful. And then uh, w one question that is, I was wondering also is um, uh, Putin, Putin is calling for the denazification of Ukraine or that's you, he's using denazification as a pretext. Why has this come up do you could you tell us a little bit about that well first of all in russia the world war ii was very close to the former soviet union right if if united states obviously was in the world war ii as well but for russia world war ii was this enormous enormous event that took more than 20 million lives so whenever you use the word i guess nazi it has such evil connotation that just um and I suppose like it's probably the strongest word you can use to describe an enemy, right? So when you describe to denazify someone, it's to take away something absolutely like the most evil thing that could possibly exist in the country. And um, it has been, again, part of this will be both my personal opinion, but it's mixed with what is reported in Western media. I'm not saying anything groundbreaking or brand new, but for years and years to try to... Um, create the evil or perhaps distorted image of Ukraine, certainly since the Sochi Olympics and taking away the Crimea, um, it has been, Ukraine has been portrayed as the state of militant Cossacks instead of pro-Western, pro-European sort of small country fighting for independence. So to try to justify some of those invasions of the Eastern territories in Donbass, to justify the return of Crimea to Russia. It has been this, the Ukrainian um, militant groups as they're called and they're, they're really, I mean, obviously any country will have uh, extremists, right? We have extremists here in the United States. We have people here with different opinions and we're all allowed to have them, but no one goes and tries to make them even sort of more extreme than they are. And there's certainly no 
huge groups of extremists of Ukraine. There might be small marginal groups, but overall, I think it was the reason for denazification of Ukraine. It's a propaganda to show, oh, Ukrainians are the ones who are against um, democratic rule. Ukrainians are the ones who are making the lives of Russians difficult. So we need to change what they're doing to save Russians in the east of Ukraine. I hope that makes sense. Yes, yes. So in speaking of um, eastern Ukraine, why did those regions try to separate from the rest of Ukraine? And uh, I mean, did Russian troops invade? Did they use that area as a staging ground? Uh, well, again, it's all about trying to show how one area of the country is in a way being hurt by the illegitimate government of Ukraine. Ever since the Russia couldn't have its own pro-Russian president in Ukraine, they needed to show whatever government there is that seems to be pro-European, right, or pro-Western, it's not a reasonable government. It's a government that is abusing someone inside its own country. I'm very much simplifying, but I think it's important to um, have a big picture and not try to get bugged down in too many details. But basically, Eastern Ukraine, just like the Northern Ukraine, is very um, uh, closely tied culturally to Russia. Kharkiv, Russian city, you can say, but part of Ukrainian territory. Um, people speak both Russian and Ukrainian. Donbass area, people, a lot of the people speak Russian. They also speak Ukrainian. But it, because also, uh, and someone had posted a question, why Venezuela, why Donbass? Well, those are energy rich areas. I mean, Putin is a very smart guy. He might not have full reality grasp right now, but he is a smart guy. So he wouldn't be going for a region that's not worth it, right? So he wanted to control a territory to both uh, show that Ukrainian government is not a government that you should deal with, not a reasonable, legitimate government, but also to show that we want to control an area that we just want to have for ourselves. And that is interesting because that ties in with another question that um, somebody has asked that, well, what is it about Ukraine that is driving uh, Putin to, to do this? What is now? I think that this will be a speculation pretty much on anyone's part. No one knows what's inside Putin's head for sure, right? So it doesn't matter whether I say it or another analyst says it, it will be an interpretation and an analysis. So I am I promise you, I'm trying to be as reasonable here and I'm not giving you any far-fetched um, ideas, but pretty much most Western analysts believe that over time, and especially in the last two years, Putin's connection to the real world, to day-to-day -day life has significantly changed. So ever since he had become the head of the Russian Federation, he's always wanted to, to be a very strong country. And because of the history of Soviet Union and having so much influence over member states, member republics, he's always wanted to bring it back. He couldn't before. But now, again, because especially he lost some touch with everyday life, it's like as if he's obsessed with trying to create another version of the Soviet Union. It won't be called Soviet Union anymore, right? But it's certainly, there's, this is empire building. So what is it about Ukraine? Yes, Ukraine has wheat. Yes, Ukraine has some natural resources. It's not really worth the trouble, right, for, to go through a war. At this point, most analysts believe is that it's honestly to prove the point that Ru Ukraine is really Russian territory. It's not a separate state. It should be ours. So that seems to be the, his motivation is that there shouldn't be a separate country, Ukraine. There shouldn't be a separate country, Belarus. And all of these separate territories in Putin's mind, like Kazakhstan and Georgia and Ukraine, they should all be part of the Russian empire again. I was going to ask a question like that because one of the maps that you showed us um, showed Putin or, or at least um, wherever he has a heavy amount of influence um, like Belarus or um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, um, these, it does seem to map pretty closely to the former Soviet Union. So I was 
Yes, but I, I think I think with a lot of people from a lot of different republics, because I have friends who are from Belarus, I know a lady who's from Uzbekistan, none of these people want to be part of Russian Federation. I mean, again, they're all in America now, so obviously I'm speaking to people who are Uzbekistan American or Belarus American, American Belarus, but they also are in touch with their friends. While the government is pro-Russian, yes, well, there's a lot of influence from Russia in those countries, they do not want to be part of the Soviet empire of the modern Russian empire. Well, that relates to another question from James, who is wondering if the sentiment has changed in the Donbass, um, or Luhansk region. Um, are people there still supporting Russia? It is very tricky to deal with any contested area like that, because there is both propaganda and a lot of money flowing from Russia. And then there is a lot of, and have there been, you know, even people I know who are Russian speakers will say, well, what about Donbass? Was that okay what Ukraine did there? You can't, not, no, no one's life is worth losing. Nothing is okay when someone gets killed. Now, why did people get killed? If you look at the root problem, then was it Ukraine's fault? or perhaps there was an invasion first and then the fighting ensured that there was loss of life. So I think it's very hard to say at this point that Donbass is pro-Russian or it's pro-Ukrainian. It seems just like in some other territories in the world, there's both sentiments existing. I think the older generations in any country, both in Russia now um, and in some of those contested areas might be pro-Russian more because they remember the Soviet way of life, which might have been easier for some people. And then the younger people who have access to more information and to more sources uh, will be either conflicted or pro-Ukrainian. That's an, another interesting point that you make just about a generational difference. Is there, what, I mean, can you make, uh, I mean, I don't know that again, we're asking you to make a very big generalization. So I totally understand. No, no, I know for this for a fact, because I uh, actually in preparing for this uh, panel, I wanted to speak with a lot of people who are either in Russia or uh, have friends or family in Russia who are Russian Americans here. And obviously I'm in touch with Ukrainian Americans as well. So I've been asking like, uh, uh, my father is 70, he's right now in Kyiv and you know, the area where he is isn't getting bombed but there was a building next to him that was bombed a week ago. He was born in Russia. He's not Ukrainian by birth. He moved to Ukraine, he doesn't want to leave. He says, I'm Ukrainian, I'm a patriot, I'm not leaving my country. So in Ukraine, even older people who are 70, they've been watching Ukrainian television. So they are very uh, patriotic towards their country. There isn't a generational um, difference in opinions. Now in Russia, unfortunately, there's a huge generational difference. So there's a lot of people in 20s, 30s, 40s who are aware what's going on or perhaps doubting or afraid to go and demonstrate but are aware of the war in Ukraine even if they won't call it that and then you will have a very large slice of people of 40 and older that would be um, you know influenced by the Russian television and denying that there is any serious like I, I, I kid you not there's plenty of people who are saying Oh, it's Ukraine's fault. They're the ones firing on, you know, our troops. We're just defending ourselves. So it's very sad where even inside families inside Russia, there will be a 70-year-old mom and the child, you know, 40-year-old child <laughs> who are not able to talk to each other or agree to each other on this issue. So it's it's not as easy situation in, in any of the countries. I've, no one's going to win this war <laughs> on either side. I think that's a, that's true. And uh, somebody was wondering, what do you think happened to the protester, that um, editor uh, who appeared? Oh, she's been on... arrested. I, honestly, everyone's very concerned for her, so grateful to her, but also very concerned. She has definitely been arrested. She's detained right now. Uh, this happened today. So this happened, you know, it's 8 plus 7, 3 a.m. in Russia. The 
on uh, Tuesday, but it happened on Monday in Russia. And I'm sure that unfortunately they were going to make, well, again, I'm sure, I'm guessing they will make a big example out of her to make sure no one else does this because getting this on Russian television and having millions of Russians see it, this was very effective. Um, it is very dangerous thing for this lady to do. And she's a mom of two children. So she's a very, very brave lady. Um, yeah, I can imagine that's a major sacrifice for her to make. Um, and Anthony is wondering how have conditions changed in Crimea since the Russian occupation, I assume in from 2014? Uh, honestly, I mean, I know some, I won't know the latest, but I do know that because Crimea is connected to land to Ukraine and that no longer was part of Ukraine, right? Or this sort of stripey territory, um, bringing supplies to Ukraine, oh, sorry, to Crimea was very difficult. So Russian Federation had made a lot of effort to show that your life is now so much better now that we are the ones that you belong to. So they made a huge effort trying to bring in supplies and bringing in things to improve people's lives and trying to sort of, uh, create, you know, bring in money to make the territories uh, more financially successful. It hasn't been great. It hasn't been great because tourism had decreased. Most of the Crimea tourism brought the money and those were the Ukrainians going to Crimea. And a lot of the Ukrainians have sort of boycotted and said, we're no longer going to visit Crimea. So it's sort of, it, it's tricky. Things have been artificially better because of the supplies and money poured in from Russia. And they haven't been better because of the lack of um, tourism. But, you know, who knows what will be, what happens with the southern Ukrainian territories going forward. And this might get a little uh, more away from your um, area of expertise, because I know that you're uh, not a historian, though you could have fooled me today. <laughs> but I was um, also thinking that about how you, Putin has threatened to strip Ukraine of its statehood. And uh, does he have the power to do such a thing? No, I mean, listen, at this point, he's invading it militarily. So if he controls the territory and someone allows him to hold on to the territory, which I actually, everyone thinks is a, not a possible thing because there's millions, 40, 40 millions of people, even if like 3 million have already left, there's still 41 left. Um, so for Putin to control militarily a country with 40 million, he just doesn't have the power to hold on to it. He gets the power to destroy it, but unfortunately doesn't have, oh no, fortunately doesn't have the power to hold on to it. So I, he cannot strip another state of statehood unless he stays and controls the territory. So I think long-term he's not able to, he can say anything he wants right now, but you know, a year from now, it's not feasible. And we have a question from um, our director, Nancy Green, and she's wondering about the 1991 Budapest Agreement that was among, uh, or I think, yeah, it was a memorandum um, with Russia, Ukraine, uh, the United States, and um, Great Britain that they had uh, agreed, well, at the, when, the, uh, when Ukraine had voted for its independence and when the, the Soviet Union had uh, disintegrated, uh, Ukraine was left as one of the largest uh, nuclear superpowers in the world um, because Ukraine happened to be the site of so many of the um, weapons and also Chernobyl, Chernobyl and um, a lot of nuclear power that the rest of the Soviet Union had depended on. Um, so in that memorandum, um, Russia said that if uh, Ukraine gives up this, um, gives up these weapons, that um, the United States and Great Britain would protect uh, Ukraine from invasion by Russia or from Russia taking advantage of Ukraine's loss of these weapons. Um, I mean, well, I think the, go the, the again, I'm, I'm not a huge political expert, but I obviously know about this uh, memorandum and this event. What happened when former Soviet Union fell apart is that the the Soviet Union had different states in possession of nuclear weapons. Ukraine wasn't the only one, but it did have a lot. Um, some states gave that up voluntarily because they just didn't have the capacity to handle them. Uh, some states only had, oh, Ukraine only had weapons, but didn't have the launchers, the launch codes, those were in Moscow. And ultimately, Ukraine was going back and forth before they decided to agree to this because they just didn't have the manpower and the, the sort of uh, 
I don't want to say the intelligence, but at that point, they didn't have enough training, maybe that's the better word to use, to keep them in possession peacefully. And it wasn't something that would protect them. It would always be just a point of sort of uh, um, to contest. So the idea was is that Ukraine gives up the weapons, which it said it did willingly and happily not to have this headache. Uh, but that could have been just, you know, a way, a front to present it. But they were forgiven a debt, an oil and um, debt. If I, oh my goodness, I forget if it was gas or something. But they, they financially benefited from this deal as well. Um, other than that, about protection of Great Britain or U.S., I'm afraid I can't comment further. Yeah, and it is a memorandum, and I know that it was signed by Clinton and Yeltsin, possibly, uh, and the leader of Ukraine, I think. So I'm not sure what the, in, under international law, as if international law mattered to Putin right now or ever, but um, but yes, that would be a, def, a point, but I don't think a memorandum would have, I'm not sure what kind of um, power it would have to bind people. I, from um, what the way I that remember, NATO, NATO is more. Yeah, from what I remember at that point is that Ukraine had presented it as a, we are a peaceful nation, we want to move forward, we don't want anything to do with nuclear weapons. We don't need them. Again, it's a political sort of uh, statement to make that sounds nice, right? But I do, it's sort of, I think it's a mixed one where, yes, perhaps they didn't want the weapons and didn't want anything to do with them, but they also were not in the position to handle them professionally, so to speak, or scientifically or safely. So it was kind of one of those uh, twofold giving up of the weapons that um, Russia was happy about. Mm -hmm. well, and thank you very much, Nancy, for that sophisticated question too. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, let me see if we have any other questions from, well, somebody is wondering, Jonathan is wondering where he can get a Ukrainian flag to show solidarity somewhere uh, you can put on his lawn. I don't know if you know. know. Amazon is the best source. I don't know if there are any left. It might be a cut commodity right now. <laughs> Uh, I suppose you could make your own with um, some fabric, <laughs> too. <laughs> uh, and um, there are some tougher, que no, tougher questions that might be a little harder or more open-ended. And I should also mention that there were questions that were going to stray a little bit uh, too much beyond the parameters of our um, topic tonight that got more into uh, the United States and NATO and uh, relationships among the uh, NATO signatories. And so it was getting us a little bit for, uh, far off of our topic. So that would be for another discussion group. And of course, these are great questions, but um, I didn't want to get us too far off of this topic. Um, but, and, and these, I know these are, this is a sensitive and probably it gets um, a personal question too. And I'm, Apologize for this being so. It's okay. That's um, okay. No, this part of life. Still, I, well, I think um, I and a lot of people are wondering just how. What is the most likely outcome for the people of Ukraine? Like how? Which are the possibilities that you see? No, I, I can tell you this much. I haven't been back to Ukraine for three years, um, but you know, I thirty years I've been now in the United States, but I'm in touch with people there and what I never thought, like I have a geeky friend who looks like John Lennon. He's a translator. He speaks like seven languages, the bookworm, where we talk about history, like it's the funnest subject ever. And he's now defending Ukraine. He took up a gun, his, his twin daughters, who he sent to some faraway Western town with his wife. Um, he certainly speaks enough languages to you know, use his skills differently. And he's such a patriot, he says, I can't do otherwise. So if people like that, who are taking up arms to defend the country, I can, and uh, this is just one account and that I personally know someone I speak to, uh, but there's dozens and dozens like that, again, in my life and in my husband's life and thousands upon millions of, in general, people are so set in their ways to defend their country. It's pretty impressive. I mean, you probably have heard or seen um, the images of the Ukrainian president who has uh, really surprised everyone on how determined he is not to leave and to continue working. 
So it seems that the spirit of the Ukrainian people is doing half the job of fighting this battle, which has immensely surprised um, the Russian army or the Russian units fighting in, in um, Ukraine. So if you ask me what's going to happen next, it's not, uh, you know, the difficult thing is, is that Putin is not, is the kind of person who gives up and certainly does not give up without saying, oops, I was wrong, I'm going to leave now. He wants to come out of victor in the eyes of the Russian people at the very least, even if he doesn't look that way in the West. To him, what matters is that the Russian people think that he was doing the right thing and they won. So how do you do that? You know, you either grab a piece of Ukraine, hold on to it and say, we've liberated the East or the South. And now we have, you know, all around area around the Black Sea, but something to come out and say, I got the job done. Or perhaps, and that's kind of far-fetched and hard to believe, although I'm keeping my fingers crossed, enough people in Russia will stand up and say, we don't want this kind of leadership anymore. Now, will that happen peacefully? Very doubtful. So I don't have a crystal ball. I do not know, but I know for sure Putin is not going to give up. And judging from what has happened, uh, almost three weeks of resistance in Ukraine, Ukraine's not giving up either. So it's a military conflict that doesn't have a military resolution. No one's going to have a permanent ceasefire. Uh, no no-fly zone at this point, I can imagine. Um, so obviously Ukrainian people very much want um, the missiles to stop falling, the rockets to stop falling, because the rocks have been devastating. And that won't stop because NATO, perhaps rightfully so, doesn't want the World War III. I mean, that is really scary. So it's, it's really a conflict that I honestly don't see a resolution to right now. Uh, but I'm hoping perhaps, perhaps as things escalate in Russia and they continue this draws out, um, the cabinet, Putin's cabinet becomes a little scared of what is happening and what it might mean to them since the sanctions continue. And this obviously already affects the regular people in Russia, but it will continue affecting the elite as well. So the hope is, is that it affects them enough that someone either convinces Putin or perhaps replaces Putin. Again, it's so hard to say for sure what might happen, but those are a few scenarios in my head. Well, you also are making me think of a, a story I'd heard just yesterday or the day before uh, about a Ukrainian grandmother who sounds kind of like your father in that she's an ethnic Russian who uh, grew up in Ukraine and never felt that, um, didn't grow up with a strong feeling of patriotism, but um, now certainly does. And uh, just what it's like to um, be a regular uh, Ukrainian now thinking about fighting and that kind of um, resistance that um, Putin's armies will be uh, facing. And I, I posted a few resources in the chat in case um, people are interested. And there is um, a story from the Center for Investigative Reporting there, if you'd like to hear a, a story that interviews people who were then or are still um, in Ukraine right now. And it's a pretty um, scary but inspiring to hear what um, some people are prepared to do. and. Um, and you know, I was also wondering about whether or not the war in Afghanistan is a factor at all. That former war is that something that people might be talking about? You know, it's 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 interesting. It's been brought up a lot, and it's both similar and very different. The big similarity is that Russia is getting involved where they shouldn't be. Uh, the big difference is that um, this is really close to home. This is really, as you have heard so many mixed Russian Ukrainian families. Had people in Russia known the truth, would they stand for this? Absolutely not. I, have, I completely believe had the truth come out, people would be horrified and say, we had no idea. They would say that we wouldn't let this happen. The problem is they don't know, or they're misled to the point where they can't possibly believe this. So the difference here is that while yes, it's both the same is that Afghanistan um, people and you know ultimately Taliban 
fought against Russian occupation and would continue fighting till the dying end, the same thing would likely happen in Ukraine, is that even if this huge military machine of Russia will invade Ukraine and devastate the country and control certain cities, even if they overrun Kiev, the capital, the resistance will continue in different parts. They will regroup. They perhaps the government will move west, but then they will continue fighting against Russia. And I'm not saying it as a Ukrainian American, I'm saying it as an, a person who reads enough and sees enough what happened in the last two weeks is that they're not giving up. So that's sort of similarity to Afghanistan. But the difference is, is that the people speak the same language almost. They understand each other, even if they're two different languages, they're able and they're really so tied culturally and with family ties. It's just, it's, it's like two, you know, it's, it's think of it as that uh, we're Americans here in the Northeast and then there is people in Texas. They wear different cowboy boots. They have different hats. They might speak tiny bit differently, right? Different swag or different uh, mm -hmm. um, pronunciation of things, but we're still Americans, right? I mean, I consider myself an American first. I couldn't live in Ukraine at this point because that's not my culture anymore. But uh, could I live in Texas? Might be tricky, right? I'm more of a Northeast girl. So the same thing with Russians and Ukrainians. They're very close, but they have slightly different sort of cultural things, kind of details. But boy, it, it's very tough. Yeah, it's like a civil war, it sounds like, more like. Well, except for they're two different states, right? right? So <laughs> Culturally, I guess. But um, and uh, let's see. Um, so I did just reshare. I think I shared everything too soon before everybody had joined in the webinar. I thought I could paste it quickly before I would forget, but I just reshared everything. And I'll also be sure to email all of the people who've registered using the email addresses you registered with. Um, so another question I see if somebody is wondering about Crimea, whether or not opinion has changed there, if the wondering if you know whether the majority of Crimea supports Ukraine? You know, it's very, um, I don't, the, the easy answer is I don't. However, Crimea never fully wanted to be part of Ukraine or Russia. If you think of it, the ethnic people who lived there, they were the Tatars and sort of the Ottoman Empire descendants. There are a lot of Greeks in Crimea because there used to be ancient Greek colonies and they've stayed in that area. So Crimea is one of those places where you have a lot of mixed different peoples. And um, I, I guess I was thinking of Crimea, how do I compare it to an American? Like it's sort of like Hawaii of the United States. They have their own culture, they have their own climate, they have their own sort of cultural fairy tales. They're very different. They're mountainous fairy tales. They're, you know, fairy tales of sea and ocean. Well, not ocean, but, not, but I'm thinking more of Hawaii. But anyway, um, so do they want to be Russian? Politically, yes. Um, culturally, I, I would, they would love to be on their own, I'm sure. <laughs> but are they, how do they feel towards Ukraine? I just don't know at this point. Well, before nineteen, before um, twenty fourteen, um, was Crimea an independent entity or semi independent, or was it autonomous, or what kind of status did it have? It was a province of Ukraine. It was never independent. It was always a province because of its cultural roots. It wasn't as Ukrainian as, for example, the Western Ukraine, because as I mentioned, there are Tatars there, there are Muslims. There's Greeks who have Greek Orthodox Church. There is obviously Ukrainians. There's plenty of Russians. So it's a very mixed area. Now, someone is wondering, I don't know if anyone could answer this, but does Putin know where Zelensky is? Does, I wonder where, he, yeah, how he's keeping it. I hope it. not. <laughs> I wish, no one knows where Putin is, right? He's in the mm -hmm. bunker somewhere. Um, Zelensky uh, is in Kiev, that much we know in Kiev. Um, mm -hmm. He's been amazing at posting videos of himself uh, in front of Kiev landmarks, one of his staff holds a phone to show the date, and they're saying, we're here, we're staying here, and, you know, we're not leaving anywhere. So, uh, Zelensky used to be an actor. He also had his own um, product, like, video, not, um, oh my goodness, what would you call it? Like, a, not film studio, but a production company. So, he's excellent at PR and marketing. 
and that's been helping him tremendously to, to deliver his message. Uh, he speaks obviously Russian fluently. He actually had to learn Ukraine, Ukrainian. He is Ukrainian. It's really, really bad. Um, so uh, you know, Zelensky has been great at becoming this sort of symbol of Ukrainian resistance, and um, we know he is in the capital that much. So Putin knows. <laughs> Uh, no, I see that uh, Jane uh, would like to, is raising her hand, and I'm not sure if Jane would like to um, ask the quest, a question out loud. I can allow, give you the mic, kind of, if you'd like, Jane. So if you'd like to ask your question, I'll let you speak. If um, You can go ahead. So Jane, if you'd like to, well then just, I might, I, I don't know when you started raising your hand. So I might have missed that moment, but let's see. Okay, so Jane, someone whenever- put, Someone put down in chat about Sevastopol. Yes, correct. Yes, so that's Russian that. fleet has always been in Sevastopol since the time of Catherine the Great. That's when they built that city. Sevastopol is actually ancient Greek name of uh, a city that her ex-boyfriend had built for her and Odessa on the other side of the Black Seas where Ukrainian fleet is uh, until partially now bombed down and destroyed but yes those are the two and uh, after the breakup of the former Soviet Union uh, Russia and Ukraine signed an agreement where the Russian fleet would continue staying on the territory of Ukraine using that naval base right similar to for example we as Americans have Rammstein air base in Germany but technically it's our American territory. I think you're muted, Ms. Brooks. Um, are there any other questions out there for Anastasia? Um, so, oh, and Ken is wondering, yes, I am, I did ask the questions that, uh, that, uh, registrants had posted, there were a couple that were getting more into NATO and the United States and relations uh, between or policy decisions of the United States or that NATO might be making. And I was trying to focus this on um, uh, what's happening in Ukraine specifically. So I'm thinking if, um, oh, moment, as, but I do have um, one important question. And so th thank you for that, because this did uh, remind me to ask this, that um, one of our participants um, oversees five Ukrainian consultants who have relocated to Western Ukraine. And he is wondering, um, even though he has um, reduced the expectations for these people, um, and he hears about their status on a daily basis, um, is there anything uh, he can do to express his empathy for what they're going through right now? You know, it's it's so hard because I'm here and I talk to my friends there and some, I'm always afraid to say the wrong thing, right? Because I practice yoga. I don't believe in violence of any kind. I don't want to say anything that would ignite anger in any way. However, I can see for Ukrainian, Ukrainians there certainly anything that has to do with this war an extremely touchy subject so when i heard someone become very emotional and sort of angry so if you hear one of your consultants get really emotional which they probably won't since you're their boss um i, I would just sort of politely end the conversation and not engage that's the only thing i would say that can go wrong is that if you try to like prove a point or explain no no but it's this I think they're really rightfully so very emotional right now where it's hard to be objective. So um, that, that's just my policy. I, I walk away from anything that I know I cannot change or convince someone. Um, but what they really, really appreciate and that, that I do, for example, we collect supplies. I take a picture of those supplies uh, and say, hey, I have like my living room full of boxes. It's coming out, we're with you. So I send those pictures out and they are really, really grateful. Who gets those boxes, we don't know, but it's the sentiment that we want to help. Um, Elizabeth, can I have your note? My daughter is listening to the background. Oh, I doubt anyone can read Russian, but like I had my daughters write notes and those notes are in Russian. None of us speak or write Ukrainian, but the note says, thank you for being so brave and you know, keep up the good work and we're thinking of you. 
small note, but like if an um, Eagle Scout, by the way, bravo, bravi, uh, great job, keep up the good work. So if you like go on Google Translate, look up word happiness, or maybe not happiness, maybe peace, right? Translate it into Ukrainian, add that to your donations, send that as a picture to your consultant. Like we wish you peace, that one line. I think if you do like make that a little extra effort to write it in Ukrainian, it makes a big difference. That's true. Thank you for that. Um, and let's see, I think that has taken us through um, most of the, yeah, pretty much all of the related questions. If I may just say one um, last thing, and this is just like uh, one of the reasons why I guess we're doing this program, like why should Ukraine even matter, right? I mean, it's a small country, technically, the size of Texas in uh, Eastern UK, Europe, but I, I do honestly believe, and I'm not the only one, that I think um, at this point, if Mr. Putin doesn't get resistance on this issue, it's only going to get worse. I don't want to scare anyone. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm, maybe I'm not the only one who thinks this, that his ambitions are now going to stop on Ukraine. So while I certainly don't want the war to escalate or anything to go worse than it already has, I think hopefully with changes inside Russia, that will put an end to the expansion of this very, um, very scary um, sort of outlook that's coming out of Moscow right now. So that to me is the reason why we should care about Ukraine, because if he destabilizes that much of Europe or perhaps goes east to control some other states that used to be part of the Soviet Union, that only creates a larger problem for the United States to deal with down the line and even more natural resources because ultimately it's all oil, right? That we all thought this is why he wanted to influence Venezuela. This is why he was in so many areas. Uh, so we need to make sure that doesn't become a bigger problem than it already is. Um, well, I will echo the words of one Zoom user uh, that Anastasia Super awesome discussion, and thank you so much. And we have another thanks um, from Chantel and uh, and who looks forward to other events too. And so do I. And I, I um, really appreciate your sharing your um, background, your knowledge, and your uh, feelings about this. Really. And I just have to say, and this is this is where I say crying and we say goodbye, but Ridgewood has been amazing at helping and collecting supplies and just sending good wishes and myself and so many Russian and Ukrainian Americans are so touched. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anastasia. And please, I hope you and your family stay safe. I think about your father too. And thank you very much, everybody else for participating. And I'll share these resources again with you. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you.